I hope you guys are excited as I am about World Oceans Day. It has been an eventful day to say the least. You know, it's uh, hopefully you guys have been keeping track with uh, everything that we've had going on the last couple months. Oh, already seeing. Okay, here, I'm going to share my screen, show everybody where we're calling in from. And here, I'll post the link in the chat for those who might have just joined. But just to show you guys how global a community we already have, see Laura all the way in, in uh, you're in Colombia now, you were in Panama. Uh, Brian all the way in Australia. Bianca up in, looks like uh, Canada, this is awesome. So anyway, fun new tool. Uh, but if you go to the link in the, uh, in the chat there, you'll be able to track this on your own in real time as well. So just a fun little way to kick things off as we, we really lean into the global side of World Oceans Day to start today. But you know, I have uh, said only a few times, hopefully you guys may have heard me say, as a marine roboticist, surprisingly the technology I'm most excited about is actually seaweed. And uh, that is no surprise when we consider how much potential it has for reversing climate change and so many different uses that Brian and Loretta know a lot better than I. So I'm going to leave it to them to, uh, to guide us today in, in this discussion. And as always, we're going to have our Q&A toward the end. We'll leave 15 to 20 minutes for that. So feel free to put your questions in the chat. But in the meantime, I'm going to have each of them jump in and introduce, introduce themselves. So Laura, would you, Loretta, would you like to jump in and uh, introduce yourself? Sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Loretta Robertson. I'm an associate scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, USA, although that's not where I am right now. <laughs> uh, I started my career studying seaweeds and meandered through seagrass and corals and then came back to seaweeds uh, at, um, when I was a professor in the environmental sciences department at the University of Puerto Rico before coming to the MBL. And so I just, I, you know, I believe it has such great promise. I've seen it do all kinds of great things, has great products and um, just does great things for the environment. So I'm, I'm really excited to be talking about seaweeds today. Awesome, thanks, Larry. Brian, how about you? I'm Brian von Herzen at the Climate Foundation. Uh, we're focusing on marine permaculture, which is all about restoring natural upwelling to tropical and subtropical regions. Uh, ensuring that we can uh, have replete growth for tropical, subtropical, and even temperate seaweeds and kelps. And then furthermore, uh, build enough fish habitat to be able to regenerate fisheries. Uh, and that includes forage fishes, uh, game fish, and even apex predators. So we see this uh, restoring of natural upwelling in a stratified ocean as an essential part of how we actually address these climate disruptions at the same time, ensuring food security, uh, ecosystem regeneration, and ideally, we're going to be measuring the carbon export of these regenerative interventions as we progress. Awesome, thanks, Brian. Well, I'd love to start framing the conversation today around that regenerative point. You know, I think for those who've been here before, hopefully, you've heard us use that term. But just to kind of clarify, you know, regeneration is going beyond sustainability, right? That the root of sustainability is sustain, right? Keep things where they're at, and when we talk about where things are going to end up we really need to be focusing on actually regrowing and regenerating our oceans. And so that's really, when we think about the regenerative perspective, what the opportunity of seaweed has to offer. And so along the lines of key terms to know, I'd love, uh, Brian, for, for you to maybe kick off with explaining what is regenerative mariculture or regenerative permaculture, and maybe some of the environmental benefits of seaweeds and sea seagrasses. Yes, well, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, David um, Holmgren, who's one of the fathers of permaculture. And he developed uh, several books um, I've really enjoyed. He, he left me a copy of um, something called Retro Suburbia, which is one of his books that talks about this. But another one is that he's written on the dozen design principles of permaculture, which include uh, working with nature, uh, in nature, and with ecosystems, and obtaining a sustainable yield, but doing so in a way that actually helps the ecosystem to thrive as well. A lot of that work so historically has been applied to soils and living with the food forest and being part of that ecosystem. And it's very popular here in Australia. Extending that to kelp forests and extending that to the seaweed forests is what we're thinking about. And you know, so much of technology in the sea historically has been extractive. What we're hoping to do, maybe this will be the first generation of developing technologies that are regenerative, that at the same time that we obtain a sustainable yield, we're actually regenerating the population of fishes, the fish habitat, and really facilitating 
that regeneration of a decimated ecosystem. I was amazed to read, for example, in Santa Barbara, I went back to the 1850s and found US geodetic survey maps showing a river of kelp, like almost a kilometer wide, going from central California all the way past the Mexican border. And that river of kelp persisted on decade after decade of maps until the 1930s, where the farming had created enough tillage, enough runoff, enough silt, and enough um, nutrient in inputs that the visibility dropped so much that juvenile kelps couldn't grow from 25 meters below the surface back up to the surface again. And it literally disrupted that continuous river of kelp. It was such a big continuous river that they had to put it on the map as a hazard to navigation because you couldn't get into Santa Barbara Harbor without crossing the river of kelp. That's how big it was. And no one alive today has a living memory of the kelp forest that once were. So when I talk about regeneration, it's restoring those ecosystem services from the shifting baselines that may have been a century or more old. And then secondly, to actually uh, you know, regenerate the fisheries that we may have lost in re recent decades. Awesome, thanks, Brian. Loretta, right. curious to hear your perspective as well. Yeah, no, it, I would just add that what we're trying to do with our research is developing systems that we can deploy strategically in areas that we want to help clean up the environment and reconnect habitats and create nursery grounds for fishes and, and other organisms. So not just, it's, it would be great to restore ecosystems as they are, but you know, have a farm system that we can grow seaweeds that can make the water and the environment a better place again so that that ecosystem can, can restart and, and continue to grow. And that's a really good point. I think the pure restoration is fraught with, um, you know, being precisely exactly the way it was before. But if we go offshore with some of our platforms, for example, marine permaculture, we can provide those ecosystem services of a kelp forest offshore, not exactly in the same place, but not close enough regionally. And the next El Nino, the next marine heat wave, the, the creatures are gonna have a refuge there even if the kelp forest on shore is dying out. Great point. Yeah. Well, I'm going to move us right along because I think there's really this balance of both impact and, and the actual economic side of seaweed, which uh, especially coming off of crypto week, I've got so many things buzzing now. Uh, but I'd love to throw it to Loretta to start on this question, which is what are some of the economic opportunities and use cases for seaweeds? You know, we've actually spoken in past panels, Brian, with our buddy Peter Coughlin about value chains. So I'd love to just bring that into the fold here as well. Yeah, well, it's it's it depends on what country you're talking about. In in the U.S., it's really different from someplace like Asia, where they have a really well developed market for all kinds of of seaweed and seaweed products. So, you know, at, in terms of opportunity, I think there's a ton of opportunity in the U.S. to you know not not necessarily just you know mirror what they're doing, but develop new um, new products and and new uses. Um, you know, certainly bioplastics and, um, you know, the, uh, along the lines of bioplastics, making sustainable threads that you can make clothes from uh, that are made with, with kelps or other seaweeds or, you know, sustain, more sustainable products. So to me, those are, those are some really exciting avenues that are just developing in the U.S. Awesome. Brian, maybe you can bring, bring the other side of the hemisphere in on this one. Definitely. Well, seaweed is close to $20 billion industry already here in Asia. And half the reason we're here in Australia is just that we're that close to the industry. Australia is committed to building a $1.5 billion seaweed industry from scratch by the mid to late 2030s. So it's like they're totally on board. And between the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Center and the pending uh, Marine Bio Products Community uh, Cooperative Research Center, they're looking at $600 million dollars of public private partnership going in. So 310 million is already committed and another 280 coming along. And so that means that there's they're really serious about, you know, let's say governmental as well as uh, private partnerships. And and there are, you know, major programs in the US as well. Um, and so I think our first we've identified a dozen value chains, probably food feed and fertilizer are the first three categories. And fertilizer is kind of a broad area, but some of the high value biostimulants are transformational. And with 3% market adoption in the US and 6% market adoption in Europe, there's huge space to increase this. We've got partners, you know, and colleagues and friends who are just, just trying to provide biostimulants to India for rice production. And if they complete that mission, 
they will have rice for another 100 million people. I mean, that's that's assuming very conservative 10% yield increases. And people have cited numbers from far higher. In our, in our own area where we're working in the Philippines, um, they are not, you know, they do not have independence when it comes to rice production and food production. And this would put them over the top. In other words, if we had broad adoption of seaweed biostimulants, we could get their rice production to the point where Philippines achieves food independence. And these kind of objectives are of strategic importance to each of these countries. So it goes way beyond economics to food security and livelihoods and ecosystem uh, sustenance, I would say. Well, my brain's already hurting and we're still just getting started. Uh, <laughs> you know, one other thing that I'm actually curious, um, you know, we didn't really even mention carbon sequestration, right? CDR, carbon dioxide removal, right? I think especially this is the crypto piece that I'm starting to get turned on to and wrapping my head around eventually. Uh, you know, it's really actually a major, you know, carbon credits are already a thing, but they're not necessarily accessible to people yet until cryptocurrency came along. And so now we're seeing, and really to me this last week verified that a lot of these incentives that historically we'd rely on government subsidies to do, right, can actually be now hopefully incentivized by cryptocurrency. Because if Dogecoin can have you know, tangible value, then theoretically reversing climate change should too. So that's kind of one of the other pieces of the equation that I'm really excited about, especially being here where we're now kind of becoming the capital of crypto in Miami. So uh, just one other piece, but uh, that's kind of to me what has me excited about this in addition to all these other use cases. Um, I'm actually curious, are, are you familiar with Running Tide up in up in the Northeast? Actually, I was gonna say Loretta, I'm probably pretty sure yeah, you're up yeah. there. Yeah, we had a meeting with them recently, actually just to hear about what their project, what they're doing. Do you want, you want to explain that for people who don't know? Well, essentially, you know, seaweeds, just like plants, they fix carbon from the atmosphere. So they remove CO2 and turn it into sugars. And what this group is proposing is to grow seaweed offshore on systems that gradually degrade over time that provide the flotation so that at some point every, all the biomass just sinks to the deep ocean and, and disappears. And so essentially completely removing it from, from the carbon cycle. And it's interesting because to me, you know, and this is, this is the engineer in me, right? It's funny how for years we've tried to, you know, out engineer nature and now we're literally redoing nature and that's what we're kind of, <laughs> kind of saying is innovative, isn't it? Uh, but that is also part of the whole regenerative approach as well, uh, which is just leveraging what's actually been sustainable all along. So I'm going to move on to our next question and Brian, I'll throw it back to you. It's how can we use regenerative mariculture to build larger regenerative systems of solutions? Yes, well, I think there are several areas we can do it, uh, that we can work on this. Um, when you say larger regenerative systems, um, I think there are several dimensions to this. One is that we've lost an estimated 1,000 square kilometers of a colonia kelp forest off Western Australia, um, close to 1,000 uh, square kilometers of um, macrocystis kelp forest in Eastern Tasmania. And I would say between Northern California and Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, all the way up to the Southeast Alaska. I'm surprised and astonished that our colleagues there, uh, for example, the seaforestation folks, have reported 80% losses uh, going to urchin barrens. And it's like, this is unheard of. And in fact, I have colleagues as far south as Santa Barbara, who've gone out to San Miguel Island. And they said, you know, San Miguel Island has lost 90% of its kelp, and it's now sea urchin barrens. And it's like, this is, on the front lines of climate disruption. The water's too warm, the nutrient levels are too low, and the sea urchin metabolism's increased, and they've, you know, they're eating everything in sight and turning into sea urchin zombies. And that's pretty much what we're dealing with. And we see that from New Zealand and Australia all the way to California. And um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we've lost thousands of square kilometers off of the west coast of the US as well. So what can we do? I mean, well, one kelp forest at a time, we've been studying restoring natural upwelling. And I think that's important in the summertime off um, California, maybe at the autumn as well. And it's important year round in subtropical locations like Mexico, uh, in tropical locations like the Philippines um, and North Queensland, and even more temperate locations. We're seeing this need seasonally as far south as Tasmania. So what we've done is, is really developed an approach of using marine solar technology um, wave energy and wind energy to restore natural upwelling. 
and get that upwelling back to where it was pre-industrially. There's some papers that just came out in September that document the stratification of the subtropical oceans. And this is exactly what we're dealing with. That stratification associated with the global warming creates an energy barrier to natural upwelling when the wind blows offshore. And that's exactly what the kelps and the seaweeds use as a nutrient source. So it's really addressing the very base of the food pyramid and the, and the ecosystems. Addressing those nutrient value chain gaps are essential to restoring this at scale. And I think it's a problem potentially in Florida as well, both um, in terms of uh, just productivity of the systems and the fisheries. But then furthermore, when we take this to scale, <clears throat> these regenerative interventions can produce a seaweed harvest, they can produce ecosystem services, they can help the fisheries. And if done at scale, we could potentially even be cooling off the mixed layer enough to begin to look at a protective effect against major storms coming in. Because after all, the food for hurricanes are this high temperature in the mixed layer. And if that can be decreased in a documented way, we can run the models at MIT and elsewhere that demonstrate uh, a reduced hurricane intensity, for example. If this were implemented at scale with thousands of platforms and thousands of square kilometers, um, it becomes, it starts to become practical that it could actually help uh, reduce the intensity of some of these severe weather events that are associated with climate disruption. Wow. I, this is the kind of stuff that gets me really excited. Um, <laughs> Loretta, I'm gonna, gonna throw it back to you just to, to refresh the question. It's how can we use regenerative mariculture to build larger regenerative systems of solutions? Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, back, back to what I said earlier that we wanna have more flexible systems that we can deploy algae or seaweeds to a site that is in need of removing excess nutrients. And that happens everywhere. It's certainly in Miami. Uh, we also are putting in a farm soon in uh, just outside of Tampa Bay. And they recently have had major issues with phosphorus leaking and you know, not to mention just other, other nutrients and which lead to harmful algal blooms. So we, we hope to test with this system how much we can grow the seaweeds, how much nutrients they can extract. And also it's been found that some of the natural products that the seaweed produce actually um, you know, allow them to over, you know, compete, outcompete the, uh, the harmful algae that are blooming and, you know, sort of get, you know, get rid of them. So that's something that we'll be definitely testing to see if there's particular species of algae that are more effective against uh, the harmful algae. Wow. So for those who are, keep, are keeping track, basically we're saying we can, you know, mitigate hurricane strength. We can <laughs> you know, reverse red tide, right? Uh, it's just really exciting how how different you know we how different applications this spans to, and I think you know, when people realize the scale of impact that a plant has, uh, you know here as you mentioned, you know in Miami we have the red tide and, and oversaturated oversaturation of nutrients, and first off they announced twenty million dollars to fix it, but more importantly, I mean they're literally pumping the bay when when we get these red tide with oxygen to try to counter it, literally doing the same thing that plants could do if we just planted them. And it's, it's just amazing how, you know, I, I love to say it's not really an innovation problem as much as it is an a implementation problem, right? And this is to me where, you know, the beauty of our, what we're doing here at Seaworthy comes together where, you know, we help bring in the talent and connect the opportunities to say, well, look, literally all we need is to build a business to start implementing these things like 10 years ago. And we can actually start making progress against this because, you know, as we're, as we're pointing out today, guys, so much of this is known science. And if we can do this with seaweeds, you know, one other piece is shellfish too, um, which I don't know, Florida, you wanted to touch on as well, but, um, you know, between those two, we can literally scrape all the oversaturated nutrients out of the water. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. With our, our partner in um, Tampa, Bradenton, uh, we, we just got a grant from NOAA to test co-culture of seaweed and clams and, you know, clams, they filter the water, they filter out plankton. So they're removing those, those micro algae from the water and, and the excess nutrients that those things take with them. So we're, we're hoping we'll see some exciting results from that, but that'll just be starting um, in September. 
Awesome. I'll move us along to our next question. And this, this gets kind of on the systems level fun for me. Uh, <laughs> what are the major roadblocks that you see for implementing larger scale regenerative mariculture projects? For example, policy or permitting or what else we should know about? Um, I'll throw it back to you, Brian. Okay. Um, I think a challenge that we have our partners today in California face 17 state and federal agencies that have to permit even one acre of kelp near shore. Um, it's really uh, difficult. In fact, it's so fraught that, you know, this is the slow death by a thousand cuts of any startup or family business that wants to do something like this. Um, and it's been more than a decade for, you know, and many of these firms still have not gotten those permissions. Um, an alternative approach that we're using is to register these uh, marine permaculture vessels offshore. They can be barges, they could even be propelled. And those are allowed to uh, sail the seven seas under Admiralty law, which is a 500 year precedent. So why, why not? You know, we're going to build a ship, we're going to register that ship with uh, numbers on it, and we're going to take it out to sea and operate that vessel according to the navigational laws. That's a nice way of addressing the permitting. That said, it is capital intensive to build a ship and operate it. And so I'd say capital formation for scaling. We see the hectare as being a sustainable scale for uh, family-sized uh, marine permaculture. Uh, we could do that. A hectare could support an entire small village or seaweed community in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and Solomon Islands. So we're looking at being able to do that and uh, operate offshore safely. This needs to be tested and we need to actually try it out and work with the regulators. But fundamentally, we're planning to utilize the 500 year precedent of Admiralty law to um, streamline a lot of the regulations that might be needed otherwise. Curious, Loretta, on your end, because you were able to get a permit here in you know, the waters off the states, uh, how that was for you and what other obstacles you see in the way of getting uh, getting these, these solutions out there? Well, it's permitting is definitely a major issue in the US and and unfortunately, California, as Brian mentioned, is probably the, the worst case scenario. But in Florida, you guys are lucky in that the, you know, the Florida Department of Agriculture, Agriculture that manages the, the aquaculture in the state. They're super supportive of seaweed aquaculture and really want to see it happen in, in the state. And we've had just tons of support and help from them going through the process. That said, you know, you still have to deal with the federal agencies. And we spent you know, numerous meetings and hours with groups from NOAA. And, and it's understandable, they're very concerned about you know, the habitats and protected species. And they, they haven't seen any of the gear that we're using before. So they don't know how organisms are gonna to respond to it. And we're just trying to help get them to, to understand that we've deployed these same systems now in New England, in Alaska on much, much larger scales where there are lots of marine mammals, et cetera, and have had zero issues with, with species um, getting entangled or et cetera. And so we're, we're hoping that with at least these research projects, We'll be able to collect enough data that will make those agencies feel more comfortable about the type of gear that we're using and 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 be more open about that that permitting process and have it be much more streamlined well one of my my favorite sayings is you know we've for years allowed policy to drive innovation and again for solving these problems right we need innovation to start driving policy and you know brian i think what you're doing is a great case to show like hey if you can't implement those those solutions here because of bureaucracy you can go to Australia and do it because it's a global ocean and we just need to get these solutions implemented. But at the same time, Loretta, I think what you're doing is at least proving the case to people who may be a little slow at adopting, um, you know, the actual need for it. So, you know, I know again, here in Miami, we have the $20 million fund that's being run by um, the chief bay officer and, uh, and the resiliency um, committee here in Miami. And, you know, if they want these solutions to get implemented, they have the money for it, <laughs> then they have to align the policy as well, theoretically. So that's going to be an interesting case. But again, you know, something we're excited that you already have lined up for us to hope, hopefully get to get building this summer. Um, I'm going to, I kind of already hit on our next question, but curious to hear your guys' thoughts. And, and Laura, I'll throw it back to you. What role do you see carbon credits and or crypt cryptocurrencies or any other incentives coming for regenerative mariculture? You want me to start? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess from my experience so far with the teams in both, well, in Florida and Puerto Rico and in Belize that there's just, 
you know, a, not enough funds for the farmers to get started. And, you know, there's a lot of risk because the markets aren't so, so developed in the States and particularly in you know, places like Florida or very much in Puerto Rico. And so it, it could be transformative in, in order to, you know, get those, those people going and get the market going. Absolutely. Brian, curious to hear your thoughts. Well, the way we've modeled our food, feed, and fertilizer markets, the carbon potential is maybe 1% to 10% of the revenue stream for the residual seaweed that we're not using for food or feed or fertilizer. Um, so it's, it's a good start and it's something that we should document and measure, but it's a small part of the value chain overall. That said, I think there is great potential to actually scaling this and uh, being able to identify um, safe methodologies that can be used to uh, document and measure residual seaweed that can sink to the middle and deep ocean. And I think there's good potential for um, being able to track that very effectively and be able to identify the major basins of the ocean where they're well oxygenated and there's plenty of room in a distributed way to uh, document the sinking of, of the seaweed and it's uh, distributed and, and enable it to go. To that end, you know, I think there's a philosophical thing, and that is many of the excesses that we've had in our society have been about money, money, money as a single hand, you know, minded, reduced, reduced focus. And I think just going after carbon, carbon, carbon could actually be a limitation as well. And we want a more holistic and integrated part that really brings in ecosystems and caring about the earth and caring about humanity. And to that end, what we've designed is something called the kelp coin. Now, the kelp coin is something that I have actually have a link in the chat. Our kelp coin is meant to follow the life cycle of marine permaculture. And that is, kelp coin is a forward contract on a ton of living kelp forest, like what's around me right now, um, living on a marine permaculture platform. And so that means that within 48 months of having a kelp coin, that's going to represent a ton of living kelp forest. And that once that coin matures, and it's actually documented by third parties and all the rest, then it becomes part of the regeneration. And that regeneration is specifically the kelp continues to grow. It continues to provide a sustainable yield. It provides fish habitat. The fish continue to grow. It's regenerative and it's actually paying dividends back to nature. We view this as part of the regenerative power that's exponential. I mean, ultimately it's, it's determining the regeneration of a healthy ocean and a healthy climate. And then finally, when someone decides to retire a kelp coin, we will sink a ton of dry seaweed, which corresponds to a ton of carbon dioxide into the middle and deep ocean. So it has a residual value that's based on carbon. But that's like just, it's the carbon standard instead of the gold standard. That's just like a residual value. Whereas we feel as though the real value of a kelp coin is in the regeneration of fish habitat, of ecosystems and ecosystem services. I was gonna add a quick follow on on that because I've also heard about biodiversity credits being a thing. Is that also on your radar, Brian? It is, you know, we work with Regen Networks and they have a carbon plus kind of approach, which is great. But right now that's a light, little teeny tail on a, on, a, on a dog that's actually a very small part of the, the seaweed value proposition. So we need to really uh, move those ecosystem services from below 1% to something that's really highly valued. And as part of the 17 SDGs, eventually those ecosystem services and those sustainable de development goals can be quantified and valued. But we think those have enormous value now, and that's why we created the kelp coin as an integrated approach to really talk about, you know, what are we going to do to regenerate a healthy climate, as David Attenborough has so eloquently described in his recent documentaries. Awesome. Wow. I, I honestly didn't even remember that you made the kelp coin, and then you brought it up, and I was like, how did I forget this? Um, no worries. Awesome. <laughs> well, I'm going to move on to our last question before Q&A. So again, Feel free to get those questions in the chat. I've seen the chat lighting up today. So awesome, guys. Um, Brian was taking initiative and in answering them before we even got the Q&A. So that's, that's brownie points. Uh, last question, and I'll throw it back to you, Loretta, to start, is what advice do you have for current or aspiring entrepreneurs looking to take the leap into regenerative mariculture or more general clean tech slash blue tech? Wow, I'm I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer. I'm a scientist, but <laughs> hey, that's a, that's the point. We need both. We need all the perspectives on this. Right. Uh, I I guess just really get to know your your permitters and your sites and site selection is really key uh, for a farm and um, build on that value chain. So you know, get connections with um, products that that can be made from from that seaweed and because there there are so many 
and there there is a lot of possibility but you have to make that connection beforehand uh, i'll translate that a little uh, you know <laughs> no, it's, it's perfect uh, but we say product market fit right basically and that's that's honestly part of the work we're supposed to do or we will do as a, as, as our venture studio is align up those you know if we're building the supply right then we need to make sure there's demand so that we know there is that whole value chain as you mentioned of creating the product and knowing that the end use case is there or that isn't even an end use case that it's a you know mid use case and then hopefully ends up being something even more for example recycling or using seaweed as bioplastic and then that bioplastic getting turned into biochar so you use as fertilizer right one example so and if you want to take the deep dive by the way into value chains that was another panel it's on our website uh, on the events tab all right so going back to you brian for your your answer to the question what advice you have for current aspiring entrepreneurs well, we've identified a dozen value chains for seaweed, and we talk about the seven Fs, food, feed, and fertilizer, fish, fiber, biofuel, and a funny F, pharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals. So um, you know, that's just half of the kind of value chains that are possible. We're just establishing right now um, some imports to the United States of nutraceuticals that are based on tropical red seaweeds. And that we think that's gonna be valuable, and it's been proven as an analgesic and as a superfood and we're taking them daily ourselves now. That's a nice start. I think even more interesting may be having gardens where we actually use uh, these seaweed foliar biostimulants. Uh, we're in the process of developing those for the tropics and there are other biostimulants as well. But with a 3% market uh, adoption in the US uh, and you know, I, I have to relate the story, the, um, the vineyards in California wouldn't think of doing business without seaweed foliar biostimulants because it increases the number of grapes, it increases the size of the grapes and the total yield per acre. And so uh, it's a it's already well accepted in these high value industries. Um, and with application rates of as little as two liters per, per acre, it doesn't take very much biostimulant to go a long way in upregulating the gene expression of the plants and producing higher yields, even over replete MPK fertilizer. So it presents a huge opportunity and that's just one of these markets to build these value chains. And I think there's a chance to get involved from an entrepreneurial sense and really help build out those markets in the US because we have a $20 billion industry in, in Asia, but you know we need to build those billion dollar industries in the, in the States. And I think there's an opportunity to do so. Then furthermore, there are those that really wanna get fins in the water and really want to get out there. And we're hoping in the near future to be able to have a, um, a kit, if you will, that will help people build a hectare scale marine permaculture offshore in the near future. We've got to test that probably in Australia and the Philippines, uh, and then eventually get this technology to the States as well. And that will require, you know, working out the regulatory questions, et cetera. But in the meantime, there's probably the dozen value chains that we can work with. And I, I'd encourage people to get in touch. I'll leave my contact information. And it's an opportunity to really say, okay, how can we start building these seaweed businesses today? and building that market that can really help lift the entire industry. And I think the great point to add is literally, we've had a whole in-depth conversation for over a half hour now, and we still haven't covered all the value chains, right? I mean, just half of them. Yeah, right? Like Yeah, and yep. let me just throw in really for quickly for what Brian said about a toolkit for farmers. Actually, GreenWave has already been beta testing one for um, focus more on kelp farmers, but they're for every state in the US. And just to promote that, um, you know, type of business and definitely, you know, and I think facilitate permitting. Um, right, and and you know, one percent the inshore waters, even in Florida, are um, eutrophic. They have too many nutrients, and this is a a really good focus there. And a lot of our work with the Climate Foundation is going more offshore. So think uh, something that's closer to the Bahamas, or you know, basically those blue waters. Those blue deep waters are where we see we try to address that other ninety nine percent of the tropical and subtropical ocean that's really offshore and really asking the question. On a, on a scaled way. Um, and maybe it's islands or other places with access to deep water. Uh, that's where we can deploy marine permaculture most easily. Yeah. And I, I just want to add that my, my two favorite other value chain pieces we, we glanced over, which is, you know, if we incorporate seaweed into livestock feed, right, it cuts methane emissions, correct me if I'm wrong, 80% at least, right? It depends uh, on the species you feed them. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of species to choose from. Yes. And then, well, I know sargassum is obviously the one here in South Florida. Um, and then the other piece that, you know, a lot of people are, are you know, don't realize is omega-3s, right? Everyone says, oh, well, it comes from fish oil. Well, where do the fish get it from, right? 
seaweeds and, and, okay. and seagrass. Exactly. So microalgae and microalgae. You guys know better than I do, uh, <laughs> but I, I do my best as a generalist. Uh, but no, you know, that that's kind of the point though. And I think, you know, when we, and just to kind of wrap up before we go to Q and A, you know, when we think about just what we're building as regenerative systems, right? I mean, this is why it's the foundational piece of building these regenerative systems and regenerative blue economies as a whole, because it literally is like the anchor of the ecosystem. I'm sure there's a better word for it, but, but right, that's, that's really to me the, the building block. So, um, you know, just love highlighting like how quote unquote innovative this quote unquote technology is when the reality is that it's really what we should have been focusing on all along for reversing climate change. So awesome discussion, guys. Thank you so much. We are going to move on to Q&A. And so I'm going to start out by asking Jennifer to please unmute and ask her question. Hi, I was um, curious about the Running Tide project because we've heard a lot about it locally. And I'm curious about a couple of things. One, just any existing framework on quantifying sequestration from seaweed, because we're not really, I don't think we have parameters upon which to see if it's really making a difference. And two, if there's um, scientific information on how deep that seaweed has to be dumped in order to degrade and not release the carbon after it's harvested. Thank you. Uh, that's a good point. Um, our physical oceanographer partners at Woods Hole and elsewhere have validated that if you get the seaweed down around 300 meters, it is typically going to be um, uh, looking at time scales of around a century or longer, which is a median time to outcropping. And if we get below 1,000 meters, it could really easily be 1,000 years. And that's based upon the currents that flow in the deep ocean in um, low to middle latitudes. Um, it there's a certain amount of time required until it reaches the poles, and that's where it would circulate up to the surface again uh, in the in the polar regions. So um, actually, in the lower latitudes like Miami, being able to drop seaweed to a thousand meters and more, which is not very far off Miami, uh, if I recall from my research in the Florida Straits, um, there's plenty of potential to uh, sink residual seaweed and be able to have sequestration times of hundreds to thousands of years. But I think it is important to be able to track it and document it. And furthermore, you know, we, we encourage people to maybe come for the carbon, but to stay for the regeneration. Because if we get to zero carbon, but it's on a dead planet, will we really have succeeded? And alternatively, uh, maybe the opportunity is that we can really restore and regenerate some of these uh, fisheries that have been decimated over the past decades. Yeah, and I, I'll just add to that, you know, if you can get carbon credits for growing corn that requires a lot of precious water and adding extra nutrients to the soil that then runs off to the ocean, why wouldn't you be able to get that for growing seaweeds? But in, I, and, I'll, and I want to add something just for the sequestration and, and the running tide piece. I, I think it's, it's attractive in that, you know, you can seemingly remove all this carbon from the atmosphere and put it away, but we, we really don't know how much or what's happening to that material in the deep sea. And we, we really don't know that much about those ecosystems down there. So at least in, in my case, I'm more um, cautious about that type of um, strategy to completely remove carbon. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Loretta. Um, we need to measure the oxygen levels on the seafloor, and those are pretty well measured in a lot of the major ocean basins. And it's important that any um, sinking operations or residual seaweed go into well oxygenated zones that aren't going to risk hypoxia, they're not going to risk anoxic regions. So you know, we've seen these problems in the Baltic where the eutrophication has resulted in a loss of oxygen in the deep ocean. And the dead zones off um, the Mississippi River Delta are actually dead zones near the seafloor where the oxygen's dropped to zero because there's so many nutrients coming out. So there's a good chance to really address that. And we really need to be cognizant of those regions and any presence of upstream harmful algal blooms so that those can be monitored and make sure that those you know, situations are not exacerbated as well. Awesome, thanks, Brian. Kabir, you wanna unmute and ask your question? Hello, 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 everybody. Daniel, Brian, Loretta, thank you very much for your time. Um, as a young and aspiring seaweed entrepreneur, 
what do you guys think will be the biggest challenges in scaling up seaweed for CDR to the point we are, where we are making a proper size dent in reversing emissions? Permitting. <laughs> permitting, permitting. Right. Is there's, um, there's yeah. a lot of users in the, in the ocean space. And, you know, even if you do go offshore, it's expensive to go offshore. And we're, we're not quite there yet with the technology to, to make it cheap. Unless you can do have you know develop some partnerships with other industries that are offshore like wind, and we've been working with groups around um, uh, Woods Hole, Cape Cod, Massachusetts that you know were some of the first in the country to, to develop these these systems in the U.S. and uh, look at you know try to identify if we can look co-locate aquaculture systems with with these offshore wind farms, and then that may be. If they work together in, in terms of you know servicing these areas, maybe that will bring the cost down enough to make it attractive for a mussel farmer or a seaweed farmer to go out out that far. And uh, just to follow up on that, I think there's an opportunity, and we are working to increase the scale and decrease the cost of growing seaweed. It's important to emphasize that most of what we're doing, marine permaculture, for example, is a form of mariculture. And mariculture is allowed by right in the London Protocol. The London Protocol says that, you know, you're not going to put matter in the ocean, that we should not put matter in the ocean for the pure primary purpose of stimulating the ocean and trying to sink a bunch of carbon. But if it's a side process of a regenerative mariculture approach, it is explicitly allowed. Annex 4 allows for mariculture to take place. And if the primary purpose is mariculture, then residual seaweed can be uh, can be sunk, and that's the way that the Annex Four is written today. So there's a balanced approach that's needed, and we think that it's you know one part food security for the world because billions of people depend on a healthy ocean for their food security and their livelihoods. The second is regenerating the ocean well enough that we can actually get back to a sustainable population of fishes and habitat and um, you know, an entire ecosystem that's healthy. And then finally, we should be able to measure that carbon export from these regenerative systems and really be able to uh, have that contribute in some way um, to the overall plan. But um, my friend Christophe, uh, who was one of the founders at Nori said, do the regenerative interventions in, in, in seas and in soils and count the carbon at the end of the day. But um, do it for you know the ecosystems. That's kind of uh, his admonition is to make it much bigger than just a, a carbon play. Awesome. Bianca, would you like to jump in next? Sure. Thank you so much for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, Daniel Loretta that is, and uh, Brian, um, it's been such an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so previously I was working with a uh, conservation group and we were selling carbon credits um, for plots of, of forested land. And now I've switched over to ocean technology um, that was in Ontario. I'm working now in Newfoundland on the Atlantic coast. Um, and to learn how much more carbon is sequestered through coastal plants and seaweeds is incredible. So I'm super interested in that. Um, my master's project right now is on kelp distribution. Uh, we're finding that, which I'm sure you're aware of due to the rising sea temperatures that um, kelp is actually, um, its distribution is moving northward. So um, trying to map some of the distribution here off the Atlantic coast. And um, my question for you is what types of tools are you using um, to monitor the growth or you know, your progress uh, or the health of these systems that you're implementing? Thank you so much. Um, Brian, yeah. Yeah. Sure, um, we've seen a lot of uh, um, benefit from doing aerial surveys and satellite images uh, to the point where hyperspectral and multispectral images do a pretty good job of recognizing sargassum at the surface. They can potentially recognize canopy forming kelps that also reach the surface. And so depending on the particular place and, and application, um, those kind of aerial surveys can be a good start. It's used quite often on the east coast of Tasmania to map the kelp coverage there. Um, it's a little more difficult when the seaweed and kelp is deeper and not reaching the surface, 
Um, but I think that kind of measurement is really important. And then we have used in deeper oceans, the Argo float arrays to look at the temperature distributions, the nutrient distributions with the biogeochemical Argos and uh, those changes over time and seasonally. Um, in shallower waters, maybe there are some other sensor arrays that could be used, but um, you know, I think that is very helpful to look at how the temperatures have been changing. I've, I think we have a 120 year record off the Woods Hole Pier of temperatures. And I went through all of those myself and kind of analyzed them and realized that we've seen more than two degrees Celsius temperature increase um, in Woods Hole on Cape Cod relative to uh, the early 1900s. So that's amazing, which means you're getting twice as much global warming in Cape Cod, at least in Woods Hole, as um, you know, a point sample, and in Tasmania, three to four degrees Celsius warmer. So for every degree that you get in the tropics and the subtropics, at high latitudes, you could be seeing three or four degrees seasonally. And that's something I remember Connie Stefan mentioned in Greenland. You know, the wintertime temperatures were so much higher in Greenland that it was really causing a lot of problems. And I wonder if in Newfoundland, you'll see similar changes in temperatures that are really affecting the optimal distribution of particular foundational species. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's, that's sort of why we're focusing more on developing tropical seaweeds, just because we know the oceans are getting warmer and they're already pre-adapted to those warm, warm temperatures and their habitats are expanding. Right. Um, and I guess from the perspective of a farmer, instead of just restoring or you know, regenerating an, an ecosystem, we're looking at, or as part of basically the Department of Energy's investment in um, developing these seaweed farms, they've um, put money into teams to have sort of low cost systems that can be deployed on farms that use basically very simple side scan so sonar that your fish finder uses to be yeah. able to um, judge how quickly your seaweed is growing over time and if there's any, uh, any problems with it. Uh, temperature obviously is very important uh, and we're, we're looking at other ways to monitor species interactions. And so for example, like with just an acoustic recorder that you can develop to have real time, you can identify a lot of diff different species um, just by the sounds that they make. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly true for dolphins, uh, manatees, that is what we're focusing on for the Florida and Puerto Rico sites. Um, but certainly there's lots of fish that, that make sounds. And, um, and so I think that's a, a great way to automate that process of understanding what's, what's there, what's the biodiversity like, et cetera. Right. That's a really good point, Loretta. And I'd just like to add that on our um, offshore uh, marine permaculture platforms in the Philippines, we have a platform in 350 meters of water and we have an amazing array of creatures there, thousands of sardines, Hundreds of tuna come in. We've had a family of dolphins spend more than a month hanging, hanging out. And we even had a whale shark swim 200 kilometers to go and spend three days eating the algae. In fact, we've got this beautiful sonogram of a 17-foot-long uh, whale shark. It's like a picture only a mother could love, you know, but it's like <laughs> one of those things where we got this, nice. you know, audio image of the of the whale shark and uh, verified visually as well. Um, and so I think it's just testament to the regenerative characteristics of these offshore platforms. They do attract fish, but we already see evidence of squid laying eggs on the seaweed lines of juvenile fish that are younger than the deployments. And I think with isotopic studies, we could validate the regenerative nature of the fish that are actually growing on the, these offshore platforms. And we're looking forward to uh, working with colleagues in academia and elsewhere to demonstrate this and really document the regenerative properties of uh, offshore mariculture. Yeah, and it, it doesn't have to be completely offshore either for our sure. farms that are just you know a mile or two offshore you, being in the water less than 12 hours they've had fish recruitment and even baby reef squid that are really the absolute cutest thing ever <laughs> excellent awesome <laughs> all right i'm gonna have we're gonna try to fit in two more questions in the next 10 minutes plus some last announcements kirsten would you like to jump in and ask your question Absolutely. Thanks, Loretta and Brian. Um, so I'm curious how you scope a project that can have such a broad impact or reach, um, as well as like be broadly impacted. So the example I'm, that comes to my mind is just like the kelp forest off the coast of the US, the West Coast. Um, it was like 
a problem caused by over hunting of seals and now there's lots of urchins and they're eating all the kelp. So even if you plant new kelp there, like without solving the urchin problem, they're gonna just eat it. Um, but obviously you can't solve everything. So I'm really curious about in your own work, um, sort of how you scope these problems um, that need to be addressed holistically, but um, without, let's say, boiling the ocean. That's a really yeah. good point. Um, Loretta, do you want to go? I, I could just say from, from my experience, it's just really building a broad team that has experience in a lot of different areas. So we have people, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist, but we have engineers, we have economists, um, we have modelers, et cetera. And, and having all of them at the table is really powerful because they each come with a different perspective and has really helped us um, refine and build, you know, better systems that beyond what we had originally thought, of, you know, we're thinking about. Yes, and so adding to that, um, you know, the root cause of these climate disruptions on the west coast in particular are that the water is too warm and the temperature and the nutrient levels are too low. And so we try to address those root environmental problems with the restoring natural upwelling. And that's one reason we focused on offshore techniques um, that enable um, you know, the restoring this natural upwelling and providing the environmental conditions that will enable the kelp forest ecosystem to thrive once again. So I think you've touched on something very important that if we do these interventions, but we haven't addressed the environmental problems that are underlying them, they'll just recur. In fact, I don't blame the sea urchins so much. They, there's a, a, this talk I attended in Woods Hole where the, it turns out the sea urchin metabolism is upregulated at the higher temperatures. So they actually get hungrier and it just kind of goes into this bi-stable condition. So if we could, you know, regenerate those ecosystem services offshore, potentially harvest enough of those sea urchins, rehabilitate the sea urchins with kelp off the marine permaculture, we could actually feed them. They actually um, get, get back to healthy productivity uh, and, and they can actually be serving fish markets as well as uh, even the sea otters will not touch uh, the sea urchin zombies in a, in a, in a Kena barren, a sea urchin barren because they're so starving that they're not useful for this, the, the sea otters, they don't have enough food. So um, I think there's a chance to develop commercial regenerative fisheries that can address these, but addressing the environmental conditions is really key. And we're actually applying to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority to grow a set of tropical seaweed, like the ones that Loretta and I have been growing um, and, and draw down some of the nutrients. But most importantly, that upwelling actually provides a few tenths of a degree of cooling and that water seasonally invected onto the corals can actually reverse coral bleaching as we've demonstrated since 2009 in our experimental work in American Samoa. And furthermore, even prevent bleaching from happening potentially if it's on a large enough area. So we have a, we do a permit for just 10 by 10 meters. We get it very small and, and measure the ecological response with our academic partners. But eventually hectares and even kilometers of reef could be protected by having sustainable mariculture seasonally thermally protecting those reefs from thermally induced photo bleaching. Awesome, all right, one last question. Neil, would you like to jump in and ask your question? Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll try and be brief. Hi, hi Brian. <laughs> Good great, again. Great, great hearing Laura and Daniel. I'm, I'm calling from French Polynesia. Uh, I'm based on the island of Moria. So a couple quick questions or points. One was uh, on, I understand to escape the permitting, <laughs> to get around this uh, big permitting problem. Uh, you know, one solution, as Brian mentioned, you can go to other places that are maybe have more flexible permitting arrangements or less permitting. Of course, so, so one of the risks I just wanted to bring up was the ecological risk then that, you know, maybe things that sh should be <laughs> reviewed uh, can get done in places that don't have the capacity and the regulations to, to really monitor these, these interventions that are proposed in their waters. Um, so that can create uh, ecological risk also taking it far offshore where there's no regulations, you know, bad actors to do bad things where there are no regulations. Um, and Loretta mentioned the risk of, you know, some of this could be really global risks of, of geo, bad, bad geoengineering experiments, but also um, uh, an economic risk or to inequality if a lot of these investments, particularly offshore, are really capital intensive and the capital is owned by the wealthy. And so we may end up in a world, you know, where we, hopefully a post-carbon, but still have all of the inequalities and how do we guard against that with some of these offshore, exciting offshore opportunities. 
These are important concerns. And I think there's been great work done by Tim Allen, professor at um, University of uh, Michigan. No, he's, um, he, he's in, the, in, the, in the Northern Midwest. He um, has written on the topic of high gain and low gain processes in ecology and economics. And I think it's very important to distinguish a high gain process from a low gain process. It could be that someone fertilizing the Southern Ocean that might be considered as a high gain process and something that would be perhaps risky or dangerous. But uh, restoring natural upwelling is actually moving us closer to a pre-industrial ecosystem. And I think um, there's a good case to be made for that being a low gain process. You stop the upwelling and you stop the production of algae. Um, so that's, that can be stopped immediately. Secondly, our work in American Samoa, uh, we did get permits in a matter of two months to, to, um, to heat up and cool down the reef and actually test it on a small scale. Again, it's a low gain process in the sense that you stop the intervention and the corals go back to where they were before. So I think the gain in that process is really important to model. And secondly, our motivation for going offshore is not really to escape any visibility. In fact, we intend to transparently document what we are doing. Um, I think the uh, opportunity is to get access to deep water easily. And you know, it, in the case of uh, our, our Philippines deployment, we're in 350 meters of water and literally uh, a 200 to 300 meter pipe is sufficient to bring the water to the surface. So it's very much with an interest to optimize those economics and enable, you know, we have small fishers that go out because it's only two kilometers offshore. They go out with their small boats, they harvest. Hectare scale mariculture is allowed in the Philippines and they do seaweed farms there and each farmer is allowed to farm a hectare. So we're very much intending to enable the subsistence farmers to regenerate their livelihoods. And first and foremost, it's about regenerating the livelihoods of those seaweed communities that today, quite frankly, are collapsing because they're on the front lines of climate disruption. So it is very much about engagement and empowerment and enabling the subsistence fishers to continue to live in a, uh, an approach that's climate resilient to the heat, marine heat waves we can expect to come. Thank you for that question, Neil. Any last question or any last response to that, Loretta, before I wrap us up? Um, well, I, I just say that our, our approach is to provide tools and technology to make it attractive to be a farmer and move away from that really hard manual labor. That's what's happening on seaweed farms in Asia right now. Mm -hmm. And so just, you know, getting them out of that just subsistence and really having a, a real income, I think is important. Awesome. Well, I want to take the mo take this moment to say, Thank you both again. This was this lived up to the hype as the tech I'm most excited about for sure. And I am still learning so much. Uh, please everyone join me in thanking our speakers, Brian and Loretta. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen to share our upcoming events and, and updates on our end. But yeah, make sure, I know Brian put his contact info in the chat. And if you wanna link Climate Foundation as well, Loretta, feel free to share whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, you know, Our goal is to make these experts accessible to you. And obviously there's so much to learn. And then just to share a couple updates on our end. So if you haven't heard, we are now doing in-person events uh, starting Friday in New York. If you're up in New York, our marketing director, Ben Hone, is gonna be at the Action for the Oceans event, but it's also happening virtually. And we're gonna be doing our first NFT auction for that, which is really exciting. So you can find out about that event. Julie should be pasting the links in the chat. And then if you're local here to Miami, we are hosting our first public event next week in Wynwood at the Oasis. We're co-hosting the end of conference mixer with Commotion, which is a major transportation conference here on marine, marine eh, I can't say it, marine mobility. There we go. And Blue Tech and featuring uh, electric boat startup 12, as well as Paddle, who's a bird scooter of paddle boards, um, as well as the Miami Tech Life community. And then finally, uh, just for our contact info, again, if you haven't seen uh, our social media and you can join our Slack group, again, the link should be in the chat there. Uh, but, you know, one thing that we are asking, you know, we've been working very hard to obviously build out the community and resources up to this point, and I didn't feel comfortable asking for any funding until I knew we were in the position to actually execute on our vision, which is starting to build startups this summer. We're currently sifting through over 150 people who applied for our programs this summer, which is, if you haven't checked those out, it's our opportunities for sea change, but we're ready to start building. And that's really the exciting thing. We're working on forming these teams. Seaweed is one of the areas we're really excited to build a startup in. Thankfully, because Loretta has the permit already in place and we can help her expand on the work <laughs> she's doing, which again is half the battle, but why we build this community, right? Is to create this catalytic 
network to actually activate, you know, the potential of implementing these solutions. So all that being said, you know, we're working to both do the social impact side, right, of empowering people to take the leap in entrepreneurship, and at the same time, you know, the actual venture building side of executing and building out these companies. And so uh, on the nonprofit side, we really appreciate your support. The link to support us is all the way at the bottom of our homepage or any of our pages on our website through Abundant Earth Foundation, our fiscal sponsor. But again, if you know anyone who's interested in sponsoring panels and events like these or other initiatives that we have going on, feel free to reach out to us at info at seawillycollective.com as well. Uh, we'll hang out for a minute if you have any last questions, remarks, but otherwise, I just want to say thank you all again. Really wonderful day and happy World Oceans Day. See you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you, guys.